Well, hello, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a lot of community members here, which I think is fantastic. Um, I'm Susan Bell. I'm in the Department of Mathematical Sciences here at UNE. And um, I just want to introduce our guest speaker, Dave Jordan, who many of you know or have heard of at some point. Um, so I met Dave uh, last spring when I went over to the conservation or the Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust. Dave is a longtime um, um, volunteer over there. And I went over for the first time to help with some trail building. And so uh, Dave and I met that way, kind of out in the woods. Um, and uh, we would go out and build trails together. We would maintain you know, trails and, and build new ones and build bridges and have a lot of fun together, which was fantastic. And it was on some of these hikes where um, uh, Dave and I would start talking about, you know, my engineering background and, you know, and, and his background. And I just thought some of his stories were fantastic. And I really, really wanted him to come and, and share some of that here. I know Dave has been here before and he's talked about, you know, Amelia Earhart in the past. Um, but this is a, a new topic that he hasn't talked about here, even though it's not necessarily new to him right now. But to me, it's, it's fascinating. Um, but I just want to show you a couple little pictures before we get started of the Dave that I know, the one that I brought here. I so haven't seen these pictures. So. <laughs> he's ready to be a little embarrassed. Um, this particular hike and this particular trail work that we did together was when he and I first started talking about this. And it just, I really, really wanted to bring him here. Um, just because his, I thought his story was neat, and it was just neat to see the mathematics that got involved, even though he himself is not a mathematician. Um, but I thought that was fantastic. So, um, and then after another project, uh, we built this fantastic bridge that's on the Rotary Trail over in Kenny Bunkport, kind of behind the, uh, the, the dump in there is actually a, a really cool new trail. And this was a really fascinating project. And it took us, I don't know, three or four uh, days of doing this, but we ended up putting this bridge in. And so Dave was showing off his um, yoga skills. You're not showing, going to show the picture of you, are you? And since he's going to be, <laughs> no, I'm not showing my picture. <laughs> since Dave was going to be talking about some of his tree diagrams today, I thought we'd show the tree pose that he did. Um, and then just to show you a smile because we do have a lot of fun out there and I really, you know, enjoy this friendship. And, that's um, and I also want to take one moment to thank Mary Lynn Barnell who um, helped plan this whole event and, and Nick as well, who's one of our math majors. Thank you for all the work that you've done out here. And I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Susan. Um, before we start, I want to do a little show and tell. And please, uh, if I'm not loud enough, say so. If anyone has a question, I don't mind being interrupted, so please speak up. But um, we're going to talk today about a, a submarine wreck that was found in the Mediterranean at a depth of 10,000 feet. Now, as you know, um, I'm sure, if you, the deeper you go, the greater the pressure. And you can even feel that in a swimming pool. If you dive just a few feet down, you can feel it on your ears. And in fact, the pressure increases by one atmosphere for um, every, um, I'm sorry, three atmospheres for every 100 feet you go down. That's huge. And um, so 100 feet. So you can imagine 10,000 feet, the pressure's in the vicinity of 4,000 pounds per square inch. Now, we like to demonstrate that fact, and we do our expeditions and have a little fun and have a little get a little souvenir by taking a standard styrofoam cup kind of like this one that um, you might find uh, uh, in any convenience store and we put these cups into our system that's lowered to the bottom and subjected to the pressure and we usually do a little decoration on them you know write our names or our logo or something and what comes back is a little miniature uh, styrofoam cup <laughs> where all the air has been squeezed out of it and uh, as you can see the writing is still uh, perfectly legible. This particular one went down to 
uh, almost 18,000 feet in the Pacific. And I'm going to pass it around. It's, it's not fragile. You're welcome to handle it. Uh, I just would like it back at the end. I know you've seen it before. <laughs> so before I start uh, the talk, Susan asked me to kind of tell a little bit about my background. And, and she was particularly interested in a couple of things as to, that might be relevant to some of the students here. Um, I was very fortunate to have my parents sweep me off to Venezuela when I was eight years old. Uh, and I lived there till I was 13. So I did a lot of my grade school time and formative years in a foreign country, which I think is an experience that everyone should have. Maybe not exactly the way I did, but, but uh, to me, I appreciated it somewhat at the time and, and even much more later that having that experience of living in a different culture, experiencing different economics and uh, a different uh, way people interact was very valuable. And there were a couple of particular things that that particular place helped. Uh, Venezuela is a terrible, in a terrible situation now, but back in the 60s when I lived there, it was a growing democracy. They had, uh, 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 they have tremendous resources there. Uh, oil and and farmland and beaches and minerals they, they really have riches and they were getting a lot of uh, foreign investment and folks like my dad coming to help companies develop and uh, so it was a very pleasant place to be and even though you know it was it was in a foreign country I was like any other kid in the US you know on Saturday mom sends you out to play come back for dinner and uh, so uh, it was a wonderful environment, and one of the cool things about it is it was dark. We were kind of up in the mountains in the town we lived in. Uh, there was very little in the way of pollution, very little in the way of light pollution, and we were on the equator almost, so the whole sky was, was visible. And I had a friend uh, who was, had a similar interest as I did, and we would spend hours and hours on the roof of our house mapping out the sky, and I think that was my initial um, uh, in, interest in exploration and, I, and I'm very sad that kids today don't really often have that opportunity. It's really hard to go anywhere where it's dark and you can see the sky anymore. I think that's very sad. Um, but anyway, that, that and, and other factors led to my interest in adventure and exploration and ultimately I didn't go the astronomy way when I found out you had to work nights but um, I, uh, I ended up uh, going to, uh, into the Naval Academy because uh, they offered a free education and uh, it was a good school and, and then from there I went into submarines. So that kind of started me in my life of ocean exploration. Uh, and since then, I uh, started my own business, Nauticos, and have been running that for, with the help of my wife Lynn for many, many years. And that is where um, I will begin. Um, this particular project incorporated a lot of those elements of exploration, of international cooperation, travel, adventure, and uh, it all started when uh, I was asked to, with one of my colleagues from my company, to go to Israel to investigate the loss of the submarine Dakar. Now, I had never heard of the submarine Dakar, and I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, haven't either. But we were asked because we had a pretty good reputation by then. Uh, my company had made a number of deep sea discoveries, uh, among them a World War II submarine in the Atlantic at 17,000 feet. Uh, a, uh, we did a live broadcast from the site of Titanic with the Discovery Channel in 1998. We weren't on camera, but we ran the operation behind the scenes. Uh, we found this Israeli submarine I'm going to talk to you about that was a subject of a National Geographic film and we found a wreckage from the carrier Kaga, which was sunk in the Battle of Midway, and that was a Discovery Channel film. So leading up to Dakar, we had a, a pretty good reputation for um, uh, successful ocean exploration. So what about the Dakar? Well, the Dakar started out as a World War II T-class submarine, British submarine. The T-class were the most numerous class of submarine in the British Navy. Uh, there were so many of them that 13 of them were sunk in the Mediterranean alone. Uh, they were all named after, with names that began with T. And many of them were 
fierce martial names like Thermopylae and, and, and Trafalgar. Uh, and others were less so, like my favorite was Tiptoe. So <laughs> didn't sound very, very warlike at all. But uh, the totem uh, had served through the war and uh, with, with distinction. And it was, re it was among a number of British submarines that were sold to Israel in the 60s as part of the Israelis' effort to beef up their navy as they were faced with uh, Russian and Egyptian naval forces surrounding their small country. <clears throat> they took this ship, they cut it in half, they added a section in the middle with, with, uh, with extra batteries, they added a escape chamber for commandos that was in the uh, what we call the, the conning tower, they call it a bridge fin, the thing that sticks up on top of the hull, and a lot of electronics and sonar and, and all kinds of, uh, of um, uh, equipment, and it became the Dakar. The, um, uh, let's see, the phone is not working. Play, thank you. The Dakar was uh, outfitted and ready to uh, sail from England to the Israeli na to join the Israeli Navy at the naval base in Haifa. It sailed down across the uh, out of the English Channel with an Israeli crew of 69 on board, fully trained, and they uh, crossed Gibraltar. And they were seen in Gibraltar by uh, an American uh, aircraft. Uh, surveillance aircraft, and they got halfway across the Mediterranean reporting their position every day and communicating several times a day as, as ordered, and then they disappeared. Nothing was heard from them again. No wreckage was found, no oil slick, there was no sign of any trouble up until that. It's almost like I say until they disappeared. They didn't really disappear, they just failed to appear. <laughs> and um, as you can imagine, it was a devastating loss to Israel, to the nation, and especially to the 69, the families of the 69 sailors that were lost. Now these were not your average sailor, they were the elite of the, of the Israeli Navy, and they were a huge, huge loss. Um, here's the captain, Yaakov Renan. He was he was a fairly young man. He think he was all of 35, but he looks uh, 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 older, and he was certainly an up-and-coming young officer. He was known for his independent thinking, which is something that's actually valued in the Israeli military, and uh, they, they like officers that challenge their superiors to a point, and he was known for that. Uh, here's uh, the last photo of the uh, officers and crew that were on the bridge as Dakar was leaving England in January 1968. The fellow saluting was the first officer. He was, his name was uh, Barke, and he was known as Bumi. He was married to Hava, and they had a little boy. And I, I think, um, I, I'm not sure what her age is there, somewhere around 24, 26. She spent the year that they were in England refurbishing the ship with him and said goodbye as he left. She flew home to Haifa and she took an apartment on the ocean so that she could be there seeing, waiting when the ship came in, which it, which it never did. The, um, I got to meet Hava and as well as the sons of the captain and the brother of one of the engineers among other family members later after we succeeded in this quest. Now, the, the ship disappeared, as I said, without any kind of, of, of trace, and somewhere in the middle of the Mediterranean, this isn't a particularly good map, but I, it's the map they gave us, so I like to use it. Uh, so here's the Libyan and Egyptian coast, Israel, Cyprus up here, Crete here, and this is the area that the ship was last heard from. Now, if nothing else had happened, that probably would have been the end of it, because the water's very deep there. In the 1960s, Israel had no capability of searching in that kind of depth. And in any case, there was no clue as to where to begin. Until a year later, this orange rescue buoy washed ashore. It showed up in, in Gaza. 
and a fisherman found it and brought it to the attention of the authorities. They um, took a look at it and they said, my gosh, this is the rescue buoy from Dakar. Now these rescue buoys are kind of interesting. I was a submariner. I had a buoy exactly like this on my submarine. Um, and it was designed to be, in the, in the event that your ship sunk, and sunk in shallow enough water that you might be able to be rescued, which was a rare occurrence, but could happen, you could release the buoy and it would go to the surface and emit an SOS. And then they would mark your position. In this case, that buoy was meant to be connected by a cable that would be reeled out from inside the ship. Uh, the buoy was found without the cable, the cable was broken, and it had actually been freshly broken. The wire was still uncorroded where it broke, and it was not collapsed or crushed. So that told them that it was not very deep when, the, when it came detached from the submarine. By the way, these buoys were not really that useful because most of the time a submarine is operating in water much deeper than it could ever survive if it sunk and rarely in the case of submarine sinking does the crew survive um, and the concern that one of these buoys would be accidentally released was great enough that the, they were actually welded shut on my ship so it would have been of no use at all yes you had a question here uh, I don't, I believe it was uh, 130 meters or something, it was a, within a few hundred meters. And that was actually, it's a good question because that was a clue as to how deep the ship could be. Because it could be deeper than this thing was, but you know, maybe. So um, this ship, by the way, was able to dive safely to a depth of about 300 feet, about 100 meters. And its hull was designed to survive down to about 650 feet. So because of that, they felt that the ship must be sunk in shallow water somewhere. And in the areas in, in red and outlined in blue were all areas that they felt could, the, the ship could be. Why it would be there instead of on its path like it was supposed to be was another question. And that led to questions about what was the captain doing? Was he not following his orders? He was way ahead of schedule and he had plenty of time to nose around in the Aegean Sea, say, and, and, and track shipping for training, or go down to the Egyptian coast and use his new electronics to spy on, on Egyptian radars, or, or do practically anything, and still have time to get back on course and make it to Haifa on his scheduled arrival. In fact, <clears throat> he asked if he could come in early, and they said, well, we've got the ceremonies planned for your arrival, and no. You can't come in early. So he was sitting there with days to spare, and so there was all kinds of speculation as to how the ship could get into shallow water. There was another interesting thing about the buoy in that it was not, it, it's been cleaned up as you see it here in the, in the Naval Museum, but it, was, uh, it had no sea growth on it. And that suggested very strongly that it was at least held at a certain depth, at least below the photo zone where light can penetrate and, and, and support sea growth. So that gave them this specific range. And so <clears throat> the 69 family said, we, we must find the ship, it, we can find it. And thus embarked a three decades long quest to find the wreck of Dakar. They searched with all kinds of different tools, uh, gravi uh, uh, magnetometers and sonars and uh, they, Part of the peace treaty with Egypt after the Yom Kippur War allowed them to search in Egyptian waters for, for Dakar. There were all kinds of rumors too. There were Egyptian submarine captains that claimed to have captured the ship. So there was a possibility that the crew was still alive and in a prison somewhere in Egypt. So it was, it was uh, this little orange buoy was uh, the, the, uh, the, the source of lots and lots of, of speculation. Now, in uh, 1997, I believe it was, was when I got that call, said, we'd, we'd like you to work with us on this project. Why? Well, at the time, the Chief of Naval Operations of the U.S. Navy, his name was Admiral Borda, was, who was of Jewish cult heritage, had a strong relationship with the Israeli Navy. And he said, we have a research submarine that will be operating in the Mediterranean 
in, uh, in, in 1998, and uh, w I'm willing to give you some time to use it in, in your search. So it was a U.S. Navy asset being offered, and because of that, and because of, of, of our connections with the Navy and that particular uh, uh, operation, we were asked to go to Israel, my colleague Tom Detweiler and I, and sit with a commission to assess what, or recommend what, where sh should be searched. So I flew to Israel, this was just, I think it was just after Christmas, and we were going to be there for three weeks, and I walked into, we, we were escorted right through and into the naval headquarters in Haifa. And I went into this room, after a night of sleep, of course, with um, 18 people sitting around a table, experts in submarine operations, communications, weapons, meteorology, marine biology, um, anything that might have anything to do with this problem. And they were all looking at us for answers. And we felt pretty inadequate. <laughs> so fortunately, we weren't expected to come up with answers that day. They spent uh, a week or so educating us on the nature of the problem and provided us with all kinds of studies that have been done. And I, I won't take the time to go into the incredible efforts they went in to try to tease out whatever they could for this problem. And ultimately, after they had held themselves back long enough, they could not help but to give their own speculation and opinions. And uh, one of my friends there, Israeli friend, said, you know, there's a saying, when you have two Jews, you have three opinions. And, uh, and sure enough, the, the, the speculation was, was rampant. And someone would say, oh, I think that Captain Ranan wanted to exercise his, his, his uh, tracking of targets, and he went to the Aegean to do that. No, that's impossible because this, this, and this. I think he went to Egypt because, no, that's impossible, and they would fight. You know, no one could agree. Everyone could shoot holes in everyone's argument. So uh, we were at a bit of loggerheads and going into our second week now, and the admirals from the U.S. were coming out in the third week to hear our recommendations, we had to do something. And I said, all right, let's take a different approach. Let's, and, and by the way, they were willing to listen to anything I said at that point, you know, so I had that advantage. But I said, all you're focused on is what's wrong with each of your ideas. Let's, let's forget about what's wrong and let's just capture everything that's, that's right, that's valid. Let's agree on what we know. We'd already kind of done that. And then let's, list all the things that could have happened. Don't, don't th worry about if you think they did or didn't. Let's just list them. Let's assume everybody's right, you know, instead of everybody's wrong. And so we did that, and, and, and that would take you to the next phase. Like, well, okay, let's say they did go to the Aegean, or they did go to Egypt, or they continued on their path. What happened next? What would they do? Well, then that led to another bunch of possibilities. And pretty soon everybody was playing the game of filling out this decision tree. And uh, I had papers like taped around the wall and we were drawing everything and I eventually consolidated it into a, uh, 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 an organized uh, presentation. And without belaboring the details here, every one of those circled letters leads you to more branches of the tree. And so we tried very hard to identify anything that could have happened without regard to whether it did or didn't. And everybody embraced that because it was something to do to move forward, except for one guy. There was one guy, he was a professor of marine biology, and he was convinced because of a certain organism that they had scraped out of this buoy that he claimed was only found in a lagoon in Egypt, of all places in the world, that the ship had been captured and put in that lagoon. And that's the only answer he would he would uh, accept and I can still he, he had kind of his hair flew in all directions he was a prototypical mad professor type guy and and he would say well, no matter we get into and he'd sit there but the lagoon the lagoon and he wouldn't he finally quit he wouldn't consider any other option anyway we 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 created this and then then I went back and at each node in that what 
I came to call a decision tree and it turns out that was the right name. I didn't have the advantage of having the textbook on this with me at the time. I described each of the pros and cons of each of the branches and in a little description of what uh, were the, the main uh, parameters or, or uh, uh, relevant facts surrounding each node. And I said to the team, I, so we had this team of 18 experts, well, 17 experts and our own people. And I said, okay, at each node, I want you to fill out a questionnaire. Believe that you got to that spot. Whether you believe, really believe it or not, pretend you did. And then to, to make a scale of simple, one to five, which, what are the probabilities of each branch? And I didn't force them to make them add them up or anything like that. I just said, just if you think this is likely, give it a four or a five. If it's unlikely, give it a one or a zero. And, and that was the instruction. And they did that. So then here's where the statistics professors in the room would probably shudder. But I've already talked to Susan about this enough that she can handle it. Um, I, I went back with all this data. I put it in a spreadsheet. and. Um, I, I took the leap of faith that these, once I normalized all the, all the numbers to all add up to one, that they were probabilities. They really aren't, but they were basically represented an expert opinion of the likelihood of each of these little nodes and branches. And then I summed all that up and made it all add up to 100% in the end. And what I came up with was, the likelihood, 70%, is that the ship continued on its course and something happened in deep water, not near the Aegean or the e Egypt or anything. And everybody agreed with that consensus. We had finally gotten a consensus with the group. So this led to, to a couple of problems. One, yes, sir? Did the lagoon get zero? <laughs> we gave nothing a zero. <laughs> But it was so close to zero, as you can ask me about the lagoon at the end if there's time, because I, there's a little postscript to that, but I won't, I won't take the time now. So uh, we, we then had to present our findings to the American and Israeli admirals, and I said, well, I have good, I didn't say it quite this way, but I said, I have good news and bad news. We think we know where to search for Dakar. That's good news. The bad news is it's much deeper than the the system that you're offering to Israel to search. But there are some low probability places that you can look if you want to use the time. And that's what they did. And then it became a, a little bit of a contest because what to do next? And the, the, you know, can we get some more free help from the Americans? And that ended up being more expensive than, than, than free. And eventually they put it the search out to bid, and our company bid on it and won the bid to search in our own recommended area. And uh, uh, w without, um, it took two years, by the way. So we came up with some areas. We used, I'm not going to uh, get too much into the technology, that's, but we use what's called a side scan sonar, which is a uh, device that is towed near the bottom. And now, now more often they're done autonomously with free swimming vehicles and it puts out a ping and listens and, and then the echoes that come back from that make a line and then if you, as you move forward, if you do that over and over again, you begin to build a picture of what's reflecting from the bottom and that can be mountains and ridges or it can be man-made metal objects which reflect quite a bit. And the upshot of it all is, sure enough, we found a car on May 29th, 1999, right in the area we said it should be at a depth of 10,000 feet. And it was quite a thrilling discovery. Uh, as a matter of fact, my wife Lynn will remember that uh, I wasn't actually on the expedition because we actually had another expedition going on in the Pacific at the very same time. Um, and uh, and I, was, I was the only guy practically left in the office because we had teams in both directions. But we had a few people left. And we had a traditional little camping trip uh, this was in Maryland, out to a, a camping lake called Deep Creek out in western Maryland. And we were there just the day after we heard this news was our weekend trip, like sort of a company bonding thing. The 
camp ranger had to ask us to be quiet three times uh, because we were just so excited. And the families were thrilled. I mean, they weren't given their loved ones back, but at least they knew what happened and they knew where they were and they knew, uh, you know, the answers were, questions were answered. Um, I, I have a short video I'm going to show you. It just it takes eight minutes or so, and I'll talk over it. I'm not going to talk so much about the discovery. This, by the way, on the left is the sonar image that, that led us to the uh, find. And that picture was the first image of something that we could positively identify as Dakar. I mentioned to you it had a, a um, commando escape chamber, and that ladder led into it, and that was unique. The other 13 T-class submarines that went down in the Mediterranean, which we didn't want to confuse it with, did not have that. So that was our, our key feature. Now I'm going to show you a uh, video, hopefully, here. Um, for the next year, we were hired again, this time without competition, to go back and recover certain artifacts from the site and to do a forensic investigation to try to figure out why it sank. Very interesting. That's Tom Detweiler. He was the operations manager on the Titanic discovery. And uh, he and I worked together for 13 years at, at Nauticos. Uh, this is what's known as a remora. It was a, a remotely operated robotic vehicle that could dive as deep as 6,000 meters. That we didn't need that kind of capability, but we needed something that could go quite deep. It has thrusters that can allow it to maneuver around. It has lights and cameras. It has manipulator arms, which you can see sticking out in the front. And uh, it, it is uh, designed to get really close into something and, and, and do whatever work you need. The yellow on top of it is, is what's known as syntactic foam. At the pressures that this thing was designed to operate, any other kind of flotation would be crushed, like that styrofoam cup. So this, that uh, is, a, is a composite of little glass microspheres embedded in epoxy. That, that can withstand those kind of pressures. And actually, one of the companies that makes that stuff is right here in Biddeford, Maine, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, there's basically two places that make it, and I can't tell you if that foam came from that company or not. So we, we got, lowered the vehicle. We lowered baskets to um, uh, put art items in. And our first order of business was to recover a major piece of the hull uh, oh, actually of the, of the conning tower or bridge fin that had separated from the wreck when it sank. And here you're seeing the ROV attaching uh, buckles, clamps to strong points on the piece of wreckage and tying lines to it. Here's the operator. What you can't tell from that picture is it was fairly rough on the surface. And he's ro rocking and rolling like this. And, and, and that motion is different from the motion he's seeing on the screen because that's 10,000 feet below him. And uh, those guys are, they, they have, I have tremendous respect for them that they can do that. Uh, so then we slowly, slowly began to lift the, uh, the piece. We're using a kind of a line that you saw earlier. Oh, this guy, by the way, was a young sailor on the car who was left home in England because he, there was not enough room. And he sailed on the next ship over and participated in the search. And there's another poignant story like that, too. So nine hours later, the bridge fin of Dakar comes to the surface after 30 years. And uh, it was quite a moment. Uh, you can see that, that uh, particular feature that I mentioned earlier. It's still, after all those years, it's completely uncorroded. It's made of aluminum, and it showed no sign of deterioration. There was another uh, sad story of uh, a young sailor who, whose wife was, who on Dakar, whose wife was uh, due to deliver. And there was a naval photographer that wanted to go on the ship, but they said there's no room. At the last minute they said, I tell you what, you can go ride on the ship and we'll leave this, this fellow home so he can be with his wife when she has her baby. And then you go on and you can do your photojournalism thing. By the time they got to Gibraltar, because they went around, the baby had been born, everything was fine. They sent the sailor down and they switched them. 
So the, the photographer got off and the young sailor uh, who just had his first uh, child got on and was never seen again. Uh, the fellow that was uh, pointing at the wreckage, he was examining how it broke off. His name is Robin Williams, not to be confused with the comedian, but he's an expert on marine forensics and had actually um, worked on Titanic. So we were happy to have him. That's Haifa. It reminds me a little bit of uh, San Francisco with the hills. And the big piece, this four-ton piece of the hull, uh, came ashore after all these years. Now, having done that, the ship went back out to the site to continue the forensic work. And what we did was we, with the work with these forensics experts, we tried to figure out every possible thing that could have happened, just like we did on the discovery. But this was, now we know where it is. We've got the wreckage to look at. How could it have, what are the ways that this could have happened? And then identified particular pieces of equipment, valve positions, the way metal was, was, was uh, damaged to try to, were there, was there evidence of, of collision to try to figure out what really happened. So we're looking at the bow, um, which looked quite intact. Uh, in fact, one of the fellows said, gee, it looked like it could just lift up and sail away. And as you go aft, you can see the anchors housed and no, no obvious damage of any sort. There's a, a, it's settled into the sand a bit. There's the bow planes. There's an odd thing, that's a motor generator from the engine room sitting on top of the bow. Strange. But otherwise, it, it looked pretty intact. Then you get to a point in the hull where it is completely devastated. What happened was, best we can tell, the ship sprung a leak in the, in the forward compartment. Probably, maybe a, a torpedo tube failed. And they were in the process of diving from a uh, surface. They were using their snorkel and they were diving. As this happened, uh, tons of water per second rushed into the hull. And the bow compartment became flooded so quickly with so much weight, they could never bring the nose up. And we calculated it took about 35 seconds for the ship to reach its crushed depth at about 650 feet. At that point, the pressures had built up on the hull to the point that when it failed, it was equivalent to tons of TNT going off in, in the ship in terms of the energy that was released. Uh, the, the, the rough calculations suggest that this event happened in microseconds and the temperature of the gas bubble that the crew was, those that were still alive at that point, shot up to thousands of degrees in, 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 micros, in milliseconds. So it was not a slow uh, ending. It was very quick. It was quicker than they could have sensed it. And uh, that's what I told one of the family members when they asked me what did they feel when, when, they, when that happened. So uh, we did our forensic work and uh, we examined lots and lots of uh, fixtures and fittings. And then the other task we had was to identify if there were any remains and recover them if, if possible. Now, we hired a marine forensic pathologist, happened to be from University of Maine, named Marcy Sorg. And she had the unusual skills of, of being able to tell how long a uh, biological material had been in the water and its rate of deterioration. So she proposed to us a series of tests, both soil samples, chemical samples, visual samples, to try to uh, identify any trace of remains. Honestly, we expected none, because after 30 years in the deep sea with the biological and chemical activity that a, uh, organic matter would be subject to, our experience is that there's nothing left. There are certain situations and circumstances, usually in shallow water, where you can have some remains survive, but it's in the deep ocean, it's not likely at all. But we had to do our best 
to find even chemical traces of remains because that's what we were asked to do. And um, we did and, and found absolutely nothing. But these samples were carefully collected, sent back to labs in Israel for testing. And, and uh, you have to be careful collecting water samples at 10,000 feet because they're at 4,000 PSI pressure. So you have to have the right kind of equipment to do that safely and, and, and relieve the pressure in such a way that you don't contaminate the sample. And we picked up lots and lots of other little things, bits of wreckage. Uh, there were a few things that survived. The, the metal of the hull, the two inch thick hull steel, was so destroyed. Uh, parts of it were shattered like glass from brittle fracture and others were uh, extruded like taffy from the, 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 the little different microclimates that happened in that, in that event. It was fascinating and, and, and gruesome in a way uh, study. But there were things that survived, a lot of the, like that bridge fin that popped off and there were, um, uh, there was a beautiful gyro compass that was still pointed in the direction they were heading. And there was a uh, uniform of one of the sailors, a dress uniform that he had planned to wear for the ceremonial arrival. And presumably it was in this flooded forward compartment. And uh, what I probably failed to mention is the compartments that were flooded did not implode because they were full of water. It was a huge clue. So anything in there would not have been subject to these uh, forces. And there was a, uh, a beautifully preserved uniform. It was in a plastic bag, so it hadn't been consumed by critters. And the last thing we did was put a plaque on the bow, Never Forgotten, which I use as a title for my book. And I believe this is the last image anyone will ever see of the car. I don't think anyone will ever go back. So uh, to, to kind of wrap things up, I'll, I'll just elaborate on a couple of these items. This is uh, an example on the right of the pressure hull, this two inch thick steel. And that's supposed to be a flat curved, or not flat, but a curved, gently curved piece of steel. And you can see how it's been twisted and extruded from the intense energies that were released in that, that event. Uh, the rescue buoy basket was empty as expected and uh, I, had, I had some explaining to do as to how that buoy could have survived and washed ashore in Han Yunus in, in Gaza without being crushed and without the sea life on it and all that stuff. And it was, that was really a, a, an interesting problem and what I proposed before we found this was that, um, and you'll think this is crazy, and they did. If you, if you add up the, the uh, wire, I told you it was connected to a wire and that went around a reel and a few, as a pipe, a few other bits of wreckage that you would expect to, if the buoy was released to come out uh, with it. If it, because it wasn't supposed to come out at all, it was supposed to be attached, but if it's, if it's detached, what would come with it? And if you add all that stuff up, the weight of it, it just about equals the buoyancy of the buoy. Pretty close. And I said, gee, uh, this happened in winter. And by the way, they heard some faint SOS signals that they thought were coming maybe from the buoy and then they discounted them. I said, maybe what happened is the buoy was ejected when the submarine sank, period. There's no, nobody released it. It just blew out with all this wreckage and wires. And you know, it, the wire was kinked as it came out, but it was you know, otherwise floating along and it was just buoyant enough that it was floated near the surface in the winter when it's cold and you could hear those faint SOS signals from the broken antenna. Then as it got warmer in the spring and summer it sank because the colder water is less buoyant and it sank down to the thermal layer which is deep enough to where the nothing can grow but it's not so deep that it would be crushed and that layer kind of persists there indefinitely. And, it, and, and then it, it just stayed there. And it washed around the Mediterranean for a year and finally came ashore. And when it came ashore, the action of the, of the waves finally broke that wire and it washed onto the beach. And they said, you're crazy, you know, that could never happen. So we looked for the basket and the basket was found 
but the cable and the wire and the pipe and everything else was gone and was not found anywhere in the wreckage. So I believe that stuff's all laying out there off the beach in Gaza. So that, that had to be what happened. So uh, there's the, the compass, the gyro compass. Um, this is a uh, mosaic that was made of the wreck. It kind of explained what we saw in the sonar image. You're kind of expecting a submarine, a nice long thing. Well, the, this is the, the, what was left of the bridge fin just collapsed over. This was the stern, actually the stern over here, that, that came off completely the part after the pressure hull and fell over here. And then this is the completely devastated pressure hull. And here's the part with the bow where it was intact still. So if you look at this and compare it to that, you can kind of see this and this, all these things. But it's something that we know when we do these searches that the image might not look like what we're looking for. This is that uh, uh, jacket that was cleaned up and, and, and they, it has a badge number on it so they knew which sailor it came from and they presented it to the families who then uh, put it in the Naval Museum. And uh, I talked about sampling. There's the, this is the piece that we returned. Down below to the right is the image of the sailors getting on board. And, and this is where that piece came from. So it has some of the wooden railing on the top. You can see it up, up here, that's up on the top that survived. And that piece now is, I'm very proud to say, is here. This, um, there's not a good place, uh, not, not a good uh, place to take this shot from where you don't have the freeway in the back, but you're standing at the Naval Museum in Haifa. So this is a major exhibit outside. And what they did was they mocked up this hall area and this is the piece. And as you can see, they just, you know, cleaned it up and painted it and oops, looks pretty good. Uh, one other little, little postscript is uh, the ship was originally named Totem, as I mentioned, and they had a totem pole made by a British Columbian Indian tribe that was their good luck charm. And they always displayed it on the bridge fin. Bridge fin looked much different uh, in its World War II uh, incarnation without the commando tank and all that stuff. But they would always display it when they came into port. The, the totem was removed when the ship was renamed the car and, and sits in the, uh, in the Naval Museum in, in Gosport. Uh, but the submarine never made it back from its first voyage without the totem, for what that's worth. Um, I, uh, this was the subject of the first book I wrote, and um, I was very pleased to get, some of you heard of Clive Cussler. He wrote a nice little blurb for me. He said it was epic storytelling. I'm not sure he read the book, but he was nice enough to write, <laughs> write that. Uh, but my, um, and, and Bob Bauer gave me a nice endorsement, which most of talk about him. But um, this is the one I really value. This is the, Michael Markovic is the, younger brother of, of this fellow uh, who was Isaac, who was lost on Dakar, and Michael uh, was so grateful that we had uh, solved this mystery. Uh, a lot of the uh, families were really stuck. I mean, wives couldn't remarry, and the, the rabbis would give them special dispensation, but you know, until you, you can prove that your husband is dead, you know, you're stuck. So uh, they, they, were, um, they were very grateful. And, and when, when we went to Israel, back to Israel later, and Lynn can attest to it, she was with me, they treated us like royalty. And uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful time. So uh, thank you for listening. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I ask you to remind me about the, uh, the, the lagoon. So this guy, his name is Gitai, he contends to this day that we never did find the Dakar. And, and his neighbor asked me to send some evidence and imagery and blah, blah, blah. And he took it over to him and he says, he says, this just, well, he complained, he contends that either we, we faked it like the Apollo moon landing, or we actually did find it in the lagoon and we secretly towed it out to the middle of the Mediterranean and, and deposited it there. 
And when presented with this evidence, he said, this just shows you to what lengths our government will go to deceive us. So, you know, we have folks like that too in our country and, uh, yes, sir. Oh, good question. It was about a 30-day operation, and um, we, um, we had identified an area that was about eight miles wide and 30, 60 miles long. And it was found almost in the middle of the 60 miles, but on one end of the eight miles. And when we did our first line, we ran right down the middle, didn't find anything. And then you had a choice. Did we do the north end or the south end? Flipped a coin, didn't flip a coin, but decided to go north. Worked our way all the way down, and we found it on the very last line on the south end. And it was quite dramatic, um, and I, 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 I think the story is pretty good. Um, because when you're towing something at that depth, it's not, uh, it, you have to be patient. You don't just whip around and take another look. So when they got a little hint that there was a target, they, they um, sent the... ROV to look, but it wasn't there because we didn't really have a good position on it because you're, you're towing something miles behind. So they turned around again and, and they went right, and it took them all day because they said, well, we may as well finish our line. We're not going to just whip around. And it takes you like eight hours to reverse course with this thing tailing behind you. And they came back and they went right over it, which right underneath you have a blind spot because of the way the the, the, the sonar beam forms, and they missed it again. So it took three tries to get a good hit on it, to get a good enough position to find it. By then we were, you know, we had used up all of our time and, you know, the money that we had budgeted was, was gone and we found it just in a nick of time. Did you have a question? Uh, how, does, how does the contract work? So do they hire you for a specific amount of time? You ever written a contract with Israel? Boy, they're <laughs> tough. Was there a contingency? Um, we, in, in this industry, you typically work on day rates. Um, so you get, you know, everything costs by the day, the ship costs by the day, the people, the equipment. And um, we were uh, constrained. We, actually, the funding came from the U.S., the money the U.S. gives to Israel, and that's controlled uh, by Israel. But there's stipulations like you're supposed to buy U.S. products. So we're really not giving them money. We're giving them money to buy stuff from us. So, but uh, th they, and they wanted, uh, they had all these stipulations, you know, a U.S. ship, U.S. flagship. We want kosher food on board. We want, you know, all kinds of things, separate, separate facilities for the, for the Israeli riders, you know. Ugh. And we, so we wrote a proposal that said, all that stuff, and it was going to be like six million dollars, and we knew they had like two. You know, so, <laughs> so we said, "But here are options. You know, <laughs> if you, if you, if that's too high, then we can do this. Is you know, we can get a ship from Cyprus." It was interesting. the The ship we hired was um, a um, run by an Egyptian uh, family that operated out of uh, Cyprus, the crew was South African and the master was from the UK. And we were, you know, working for the Israelis and we're Americans. So we had, you know, we just had, there was a little bit of uh, communication issues from time to time. So to, to answer your question, we, we had some pretty good negotiators on our RN2 that spent some time in New York working this, hammering this out. And we ended up uh, agreeing on a day rate for a certain amount of time. So we weren't going to be left holding, holding the bag. But they made us, oddly enough, deposit, I don't know, $150,000 or something. We had to make a deposit in escrow to them, which I still can't explain quite why that was the case. But, um, you know, that obviously came back to us. But uh, but we did say, I, I did say as a negotiating point, I said, if we don't find it, we get no profit, no fee. So I was willing to take that risk at least. Well, it took a couple years to get the contract. The actual operation took a month, but of course there was a month, couple months of getting geared up to it. But 
And then in the second time when we went back, we were heroes and they didn't, they didn't really give us much trouble. I actually think that the, the first one was $1.6 million, which is a real bargain for an ocean operation. The Egyptian guys worked with us. They were great. Um, they gave us two small vessels for the price of, you know, three quarters. Uh, and uh, we, we just, we just did every, negotiated the best we could with everybody. Everybody wanted to do it and succeed. So we were all happy in the end. Yes, ma'am. Oh, did someone tell you to ask that question? We did. Um, one of the things I, I asked in the negotiation was that if we found anything else that we would have the rights to explore it because the Mediterranean is littered with shipwrecks. And sure enough, we found a bunch of stuff. Uh, we found a 1930s era steamer, you know, Indiana Jones type thing. And, um, but the most interesting thing we found was a uh, wreck that was of uh, probably, I think they decided it was around 200 BC. And it was traveling probably from the, one of the islands in the, in the Aegean, like Kos, K-O-S, probably to Alexandria, based on where it was and what it was carrying. So the, it was a wooden ship, of course, and it was quite large, and it had several thousand ceramic amphora in it that all were laying as they fell in the shape of the ship. The anchor stocks were in the bow. The, the, the wooden parts of the anchors were gone, but the lead stocks were there. Uh, there were cooking cauldrons and dinnerware in the stern. And everything was just laid out beautifully. Um, and nothing, hardly anything was broken. Because basically the ship sank, who knows why, in the storm, and, and, and the wood went away. And everything, nothing at 10,000 feet would disturb it. Not even covered, there's, the cooking cauldron has a little layer of silt in it, but that's, that's it. So um, that's out there. I just this past couple weeks have been talking with a guy who's doing a, uh, he's at Oxford and he's doing a thesis on, on these kinds of ships and we agreed to give him all of our data. We've got 20 minutes of video, it's on our website um, that shows you, you this, this uh, uh, wreck, it's beautiful. I'd love to get back to it someday, but Archeo undersea archeology span is incredibly poorly funded and most of the time they want to just look at wrecks that are on near shore, which of course are scattered and buried. And so. uh, let's take the one in front first. This was in 1968, this, this one then? Yes. The, the yep. So what, was there an investigation into a possible sabotage of that? Part of it. Absolutely. That was, there were several committees and commissions that were formed to investigate it, and certainly sabotage was, was considered. Um, there was no evidence for anything, so anything was possible. Uh, to this day, um, there are uh, is people in the Israeli Navy which still contend that the ship was, had a collision with a cargo ship passing in the night, and even though we found absolutely no evidence for that, we found all the evidence we found said that it had flooding in the bow, and that's why it went down. Um, but that implies that somebody somewhere made a mistake, and they'd much rather it be a chance accident. But, and that would have, if it was sabotage, would it have had to happen before they left England or somebody inside oh, who, the ship? Who knows? I mean, I'm sure it wasn't, but uh, it, you know, for, for the kind of, I mean, unless somebody just went and opened up. I mean, torpedo tube doors don't open together anyway. So uh, I suppose that there could have been some kind of weird sabotage, but there's no evidence for it at all. Yes, Paul. Um, could you have salvaged those amphora or anything that you found over there? Or do you have, does Yeah, that's a tough question. The, the wreck that in question, it, we went to Cyprus because we felt that we could work with them easier than Greece or Egypt. This thing is in the middle of everything. So if you look at the EEZs, they, the, the ec economic zones, it's at the vertex of the Greek, <laughs> Cypriot, and Egyptian economic zone. So it, it's possible that it's in any of them. <laughs> uh, but we went to Cyprus being a smaller country when we felt we could work with, and we have some friends there, and we, um, we just got nowhere. 
Um, we, we, you can't really just pick up this stuff and sit, sit in your house because there are antiquities and um, the, the archaeologists will crucify you. But um, on the other, and also if you if you lift it, you it's like giving birth. You know, you got to take care of it because it's been in the, in seawater for two thousand years, and now you can't just sit it in your living room. It's going to crumble. So you have to conserve it, and you know it's. It's going to cost you so much to do that, and for what? You know, so we wanted to do it under the auspices of Cyprus, and we were willing to give them everything. We were willing to raise the money, but they they couldn't come to. Anything. So you do have to get permission from somebody who might likely be the owner. Well, the, the law of the sea is really not clear on any of that yet. Um, there's still a lot of argument and contention about it. The law of the sea assumes that you're either a warship or you're in the stream of commerce. And if you're in the stream of commerce, you are, any salver has the rights to rescue or you from the stream, you know, restore that to the stream of commerce. So um, without the owner's permission, and then they get compensated or they'll get the wreck. So th theoretically, we could say, well, gee, this guy was in the stream of commerce and we just want to restore it. But it becomes complicated with those that view it, rightly so, I think, as, as something that should be under the purview of archaeology and museums and whatnot. So if you did it, you'd, you'd just be a no end of grief. Yeah. So let me get this one back here. So the mathematical model that you use that calculates the probabilities and stuff to try to find yeah. out where the shipwreck is, is that something that you've used in other shipwreck finds? Yeah, it, it's actually a, a really handy way to do a lot of things. And uh, it's not terribly sophisticated, really. But um, it, it's this decision tree method, it turns out somebody else invented it before I did, which is fine. But um, uh, we've used it for uh, other searches where you have very sparse data, and you're just looking at all the possibilities and trying to say, well, what are the more likely ones based on whatever information you have? And the, the cool thing about it is you construct it right, and you, and you look in the right places, you can eliminate places you haven't looked because they depend on things that need to get you there. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a very <coughs> valuable tool. Yeah, yes? Am I correct to think that in the late 60s, early 70s, the electronics and GPS was not as sophisticated as it is 30 years later, and you were advantaged by technology? Well, um, in Certainly in the 60s, there was no GPS. Uh, but even if there was, that, does, that only marginally helps you underwater because GPS doesn't penetrate seawater at all. So you, you, you need to know where your ship is so that you can figure out where things below it are. But that's, most of the inaccuracy comes in the second part. Um, so you, can, you could navigate pretty accurately with Loran enough because the Loran would kind of penetrate seawater? No, you can tell where your ship is on the surface. Okay. But figuring out where your sonar is, how many oh, yeah, yeah. of miles of cable, is a modeling problem, really. Um, and you can do some acoustic stuff, but at those depths, it's not very accurate. So that's one of the reasons why we had to make multiple passes on our <coughs> sonar target to try to figure out where it was accurately enough that we could drop a robot down on it. Now, today, and, and GPS really didn't come into uh, general use until... Mid-70s, late 70s. Well, I was going to say, uh, I don't think it was accessible to, to everybody until the 80s, mid-80s. And um, uh, again, that only tells you where your ship is. So it's helpful, it's great, but it doesn't solve the, the, the biggest problem. Yes? It seems to me one of the morals... Am I missing anyone here? One of the morals of the story is that you have various elements of the Israeli Navy at loggerheads, because my, my observation is the correct one, no, yours isn't. Yeah. A fresh pair of eyes coming in with a new approach uh, broke the loggerhead. Exactly. Broke the jam. Exactly. Uh, and uh, that's a good lesson for all of us to learn when we uh, encounter similar standoffs and of opinions. Right, I think you're absolutely right, and, and we had the advantage of we had we know we had credentials, and we had the backing of of the U.S. Navy that that helped them listen to us, 
but but uh, the fact that we had not been I like to say, you know, consensus about the wrong answer is still wrong. And 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 you know, they they couldn't get past that. So oh, yes, please. In the decision tree, could you do a deep dive into one of the things that people had to measure? In other words, were you looking at the psychology of the sailors, the ability, like what what went into one of those balls? Well, a lot of it, of course, you know, the ultimate goal, we had 37 different outcomes. Um, and if I'm going too long, you can yank me, okay. Uh, and each one of those followed a tortuous path. And a lot of it, you know, we were aimed in the end is wh where is it? We didn't almost care why it sunk. We wanted to know where it sunk. We'll figure out why later. But a lot of the where's had to do with, with the why's, of course. And we considered at, at, you know, the original node, which is where we know it was, what happened from there, well, that's where a lot of this psychology got in. What was the captain thinking? What were his options? Uh, was there a, um, uh, a, a mutiny? You know, was, was there a, uh, a, you know, a, a, a spy or sabotage? Was there a uh, fire? Did they run into a ship? Did they um, decide to go do something special with their equipment, you know, so so the, the psychology of the captain was was actually a lot of discussion on that. You know, this guy was such a he was on the one hand he was such a a, a, a well respected guy. You just couldn't imagine him doing anything that was explicitly forbidden from his orders. On the other hand, he was also a uh, independent thinker, and and if if he was told. You know, you, got, you can't come in. You got you had three or four days to play with. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you could imagine he might do. And why was he so far ahead of schedule to begin with? You know, what was the point of that? We don't really know. We'll never know. But, but a lot of a lot of, of there was an awful lot of discussion about that. And what would make somebody rank as number five, say, that there was an explosion versus ranking that as number two, when you don't see anything, you don't have anything, you just know where was the last? Well, if you look at, at one of the nodes, say, uh, uh, say assuming they continued on course, um, what are the, at that point, you know, something happened, okay, so what are the list of things that inspired? So we would, Knowing we have experts in submarine operations and, and, and in the specific equipment, and they could identify different things that could have happened. And then it was a question of, gee, you know, in my you know, expert judgment, this is more likely than that. That's, that's all it is, because you have no data at that point. You're just looking at, at speculation. And when you found it, did it turn out to match what you had what the team together had decided had probably no, happened? No, not really, because okay. because we didn't, we still didn't know, what, you know what happened. There were a lot of things that could have caused it to sink. It still could have been a collision, you know. So we looked for evidence of that. You know, the the things that would have collided were perfectly intact. You know, there was no, they hadn't been harmed, for example. So, if there had been a fire there were certain things you would have seen and even in that terrible twisted wreckage that would have been characteristic of a fire. So, you know, that we, we really didn't know until we looked. So, uh, yes? How does a torpedo tube fail? It seems to me it's a vulnerable thing anyway. It's a hole. <laughs> the stuff comes out of it, the torpedo comes out of it. Yeah, kind of the analysis of, of this sinking, which was really, uh, the last chapter in the book describes what happened in those last 35 seconds. Obviously, it's speculative, but based on analysis and knowing what, how you operate a submarine and what you would do if you were in a casualty like that. And um, I put the main characters in their places and had them doing what they were trying to do. And the interesting thing was that every submariner I showed it to hated it and said I shouldn't put it in there. Everybody else thought it was essential to the book, so I figured I'd probably hit the mark. The Israeli Navy asked me not to publish it, and I finally convinced them that I, I should and could. But uh, anyway, to get to your question, 
uh, we, we, that part of the ship where those things are, the torpedo tubes and all, are is buried in the sand. And we didn't attempt, nor did we have the equipment to excavate it, to examine it. But there's no other evidence of leakage above that. And somehow or another, 80 tons of water got into the, to the bow. We know that. It's a physical fact. And it was, and the ship had to have been tilted very steeply at the time of implosion. So all that water had to have come into the bow. And if you look at the amount of water and the amount of time and the pressures, et cetera, it required a hole about the size of a torpedo tube. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that it was through the tube. It could have been the, the welding cracked around it or something like that. And the force of pressure of the water uh, is, is just so dramatic at that and you know, they would rush in so quickly. Certainly anybody in that compartment would be knocked senseless at best. Um, and then it just filled up quickly. And they, they were on their way down. So, yes sir. Are you looking for anything today? Um, <laughs> the, the, the one, there's, there's a couple of bits of unfinished business. Uh, one of them is uh, Amelia Earhart is our sort of holy grail. We've been trying to find her, been led three expeditions. We looked in all the likely places, so she must be in an unlikely place. Um, we searched uh, an area about the size of Connecticut so far at one meter resolution, and uh, it's not there. So uh, there's more places that it ought to be, but uh, whether, whether I'll be able to raise another few million dollars to go out there and try again, I, I don't know. hope so. But uh, uh, we've, we've, we've collected a lot of data. Noah's working with it now just for you know, studying it, and we've got that at least. Uh, the, I mentioned the, the Battle of Midway. Uh, we found wreckage from one of the Japanese aircraft carriers, but there's a whole battlefield out there that the his naval historians and all would love to, to map. Uh, there are aircraft such as the um, Vindicator torpedo bomber that don't exist on land anywhere, and every one of them was lost in the beginning of the war. And there's none left, uh, so to find one of those would be be quite the find for those aviation history people. And uh, we'd like to find the hulls of the of the ship. So there's a chance we might get a chance to do that this summer. We're hoping, but it's it'll be there for a long, long time. So we'll keep trying. And I'd like to get out to examine this 2,000-year-old uh, wreck. But uh, again, you know, it's, it's hard to find money to do this kind of stuff, especially when there's not a potential gold on board or something like that. <laughs> but anyway, it's fun trying, and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunities I've had and to get to talk to you folks about it. And thank you for your attention. I've kept you more than long enough. And, uh, I'll be happy to stay and answer any other questions individually. Uh, and if you're, if you're really keen to learn more, I've got books here, and uh, we'll, we can take care of you in that regard, too. Thank you.